Uh, good day, good people. Uh, we wanted to look uh, at the issues about uh, forgetting and memory distortion. Uh, the previous lecture, I believe it was talking about memory as well as uh, summarizing about the autobiography of memory and all other segments of memory uh, that are involved, in, uh, including the stages, uh, the process, and also anything related to memory. <clears throat> so in this time, we want to discuss about forgetting uh, and memory distortion trying to reveal uh, what forgetting is, is one of our objective at the end of the lesson. So one could be able to define what uh, forgetting is and also what happens to our memory in such processes of forgetting. Okay, so we want to look uh, at the uh, interference uh, theory or interference concept. Uh, it refers to the view that forgetting occurs because recall of certain words or interferes, uh, sorry, words interferes with the recalling of other words. So there are two types of, uh, re, uh, of uh, interference, uh, which is retroactive interference and then proactive interference, or what they call retroactive inhib inhibition and then proactive inhibition. Uh, retroactive, it occurs when newly acquired skills impairs the recall of older material. So new information inhibits the ability to remember old information. That is retroactive inference. Uh, new information that you've learned, let's say a lesson of today makes you forget about the lesson of last time. So the proactive uh, occurs when material that was learned in the past uh, impairs the learning of new material or the information inhibits the ability to remember new information. Where all the information tries to interfere with the recalling of your new information uh, or uh, it interferes with uh, information uh, learned uh, recently. Uh, okay, uh, this is just an example uh, about uh, the proactive and uh, retroactive inference. First, learn A and then learn B. So much forgetting of A because of retroactive inference, like what we've described there. And then much forgetting of B is because of what? Uh, proactive inference from A. You can see that, uh, like that you can't remember B because information from A is influencing uh, the recall of what of B, you can't remember A because the newly learned information, which is B, you can uh, is uh, is taken over actually. So uh, serial position curve. Uh, this one it represents the probability of recall of given word. So given its serial position, order of presentation in a list. So that's why they call it a serial uh, position curve, uh, which just try to determine, uh, let's say, a number of certain concepts, uh, which ones you may end up remembering better than uh, the other ones. So the recent effect, uh, it refers to superior recall of words uh, at near the end of a list. Uh, so it's superior to record uh, words at the near end of a list where you uh, be able to, to, to recall words uh, at the end of the list. And then primacy effect, it refers to superior recall of words at the near beginning of a list. Uh, so given a list, so that's where the serial position came, uh, come into play after. Uh, recent effect is uh, the words at the end of your list that maybe you are supposed to remember. You remember them more than the words at the first. And then primus effect is when you can remember uh, the words that you read at the beginning other than the one that you read at the end. So the decay theory, it assists that information is forgotten because of the gradual disappearance rather than displacement of memory trace. So that's decay. So it has said information is forgotten because of gradual disappearance rather than displacement of what? Of the memory trace. So as such an example, uh, the next day you try to remember Salis phone number, but it had faded over the past three days. Okay, so the constructive nature of memory, uh, uh, all such kind of uh, things, autobiographical memory distortions, uh, looking at the eyewitness uh, testimony, uh, and then the effect of context on memory. So reconstructive, uh, it involves the use of uh, various strategies or searching for cues, drawing inferences for retrieving the original memory traces of our experiences and then rebuilding the original experience as a basis for retrieval. So if one is not revising, is not reading around, it's difficult for you to also search for cues that can help you to retrieve original memories. Uh, looking at the constructive prior experience affects how we recall things and what we recall 
actually recall, sorry, from memory. So that's the constructive aspect of like the prior experience. It affects how we may recall such information and what also we are going to recall. So the reconstructive is trying to use other methods to try to remember, say, uh, let's say maybe using abbreviations or whatever, certain kinds of ways for you to remember the previous memory. So the autobiographical memory, this uh, refers to memory of an individual's history, uh, refers to the previous history, I mean, a uh, lecture of memory. Then flashbulb memory, a memory of an event so powerful that the person remembers the event as vividly as if it were indelibly presented on film, surprising, important, emotional. Very good example, uh, maybe let's say we may use the 9-11, and then also we may also use even the war if we check uh, we ask our our parents or our forefathers who also uh, participated in the war how they end up uh, recalling some they recall like it's happening now so that's the flashbulb memory and then memory distortions are uh, referring to chapter 2001 uh, in the scenes of memory seven scenes sorry so the way uh, first one transcends uh, that memory fades quickly uh, the step or effect of lasting only for a short time so that's transient that memory, yeah, it fades quickly. So the general deterioration of a specific memory over time. So this is especially true with episodic memory, the ones which I try to explain some certain episodes. Uh, because every time an episodic memory is recalled, it is re-encoded with the hippocampus, altering the memory each time you recall it. So transient is caused because of interference. So the hippocampus also, if you still remember uh, in our study of the brain, when we discussed about uh, the hippocampus, thalamus, uh, that area for the limbic system actually, which deals with emotional aspects. So you can see that emotions and memory, they are hand in hand. And then absent-minded, uh, where one tends to, you know, shows inattentive or forgetful behavior. Uh, for instance, uh, maybe when you forget where you've put your keys, where you've uh, put your uh, eyeglasses or forgetting appointments or certain things, uh, that also you are uh, forgetting. So which means uh, it's because at the time of encoding, sufficient attention was not paid on what you later need to be recalled. So which means uh, you're supposed to be attentive. So if you're not attentive, it interferes with the memory. That's why they call it absent-mindedness. Then uh, blocking, tip of the tongue or phenomenon. Uh, people sometimes have something that they know they should remember, but they can't. So blocking is when the brain tries to retrieve or encode information, but another memory interferes with it. So blocking is primary cause of tip of the tongue phenomenon, a temporal inaccessibility of stored information, where you say, I know if I remember the way that I will tell you. So that's the blocking that is being referred right now. Uh, looking to misattribution, uh, it's more like uh, people often cannot remember where they heard, what they heard, or read what they read. Sometimes people think they saw things they did not see or heard things they did not hear. Example, the eyewitness testimony, it entails correct recollection of information with incorrect recollection of the source of that information. For example, a person who witnesses a murder after watching a television program may incorrectly blame the murder on someone she saw on the television program. So this error is profound consequences in legal systems because of its unacknowledged prevalence and the confidence which is often placed in the person's ability to know the source of information important to suspect identification. For example, a person who witnesses a murder after watching a television program may incorrectly blame the murder on someone she saw on the television program. Mm, for instance, maybe let's say, uh, in the movie, a man was killing a woman, and then in the newspaper, we start to read certain stories of gender-based violence. Uh, before the story is proven, uh, you know, when people start to explain how ah, the man was wrong, the man was what, what, and what, and what. I'm not uh, justifying on behalf of men, but I'm just giving an example. Uh, sometimes, you know, the guys for the newspaper, they write in a way which is so appealing for the paper to move. Uh, but people then, we do misattribution. Uh, most of the times when we watch uh, most of the movies, most of the murders are men. You see, let's say uh, just after watching such a movie, and then uh, that's the example that they're trying to give. Uh, so it depends how much it applies in certain scenarios, where the previous information influences how you're going to attribute uh, a certain information. 
then suggestibility, then people are, sus are susceptible to suggestion. So if it is suggested to them that they saw something, they may think they remember seeing it. Uh, for example, you witness an argument after school when later asked about the huge fact that, okay, you record the memory, but unknowingly distort it with exaggerated fabrication because you now think of the event as a huge fight instead of a simple argument. A witness the testimony is altered because the police or attorneys make suggestions during the interview, which causes their already uncertain observations to become distorted memories. So your parents tell you that you have always been a good singer. So from there on, you believe you have talent when really your parents were falsely encouraging you. So that's the su suggestibility where most of the people, they assume they have gifts and talents. After all, that's the purpose of the family to, to encourage you, even if when things are going another way. So it's just an example that we are giving. Not everybody is encouraged by the family are going to fail, but they're just saying humans are just, uh, what do you call it, vulnerable to suggestions, which also influence the eyewitness testimony. Bias, uh, the scene of bias is similar to the scene of suggestibility in that one is current feelings and world view distort remembrance of past events. This can pertain to specific incidences and the general conception one is of a certain period in one's life. This occurs partly because memories encoded while a person was feeling a certain level of arousal and a certain type of emotion come to mind more quickly when a person is in a similar mood. So that's content adult might look back with fondness on their childhood induced to do so by positive memories from that time, which might not actually be representative of their average mood during their childhood. So the bias is one is current feelings and worldview distort remembrance of past events. Uh, you're watching a movie and then there's a good part of, you know, childhood is being shown and everybody's uh, explaining, ah, you know, when we were growing up, things were fine and so on. So you end up uh, having a distortion when you're remembering past uh, events, assuming that also your, uh, your, your, your childhood was very entertaining. After all, the overall uh, uh, memories of your childhood are not so much in terms of entertaining. That's the influence of uh, bias that we, if you still remember social psychology, what they call attribution. Uh, then persistence. People sometimes remember things as consequential that in a broad context are inconsequential. Example, someone with many successes, but one notable failure may remember the single failure better than the many successes. So that's persistence. Let me repeat again. People sometimes remember things as consequential that in a broad context are inconsequential. So this failure of the memory system involves unwanted recall of information that is disturbing. The remembrance can range from a blunder on the job to a truly traumatic experience, and the persistent recall can lead to formation of phobias, post-traumatic stress disorder, and even suicide in especially disturbing and intrusive instances. So examples sometimes with many successes, but one notable failure, I may remember the single failure better than the many successes. Yeah, a celebrity, you did what you did, and then one scandal tried to erase everything you have done. Persistence. So the eyewitness testimony paradigm may be the most common source of wrongful convictions all over, not just only in the United States, uh, only from Modafferi et al, 2009. Uh, so it's also uh, another influence at common source of wrongful convictions all over. Uh, so what influences the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. In general, people are remarkably susceptible to mistakes in eyewitness testimony. They are generally prone to imagine that they have seen things they have not seen. You see, lineups, confessions, feedback to eyewitness, affected participants, testimony, level of stress, all such kind of things influence the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. So children as eyewitnesses, so children's recollections are particularly susceptible to distortion, distortions are susceptible is more like a prone to or uh, what you call it vulnerable to uh, in such sense and uh, how we are using it now so the younger child the younger the child is the less reliable the testimony of that child can be expected to be so when a questionnaire is coercive or even just seems to want a particular answer children can be quite uh, vulnerable to providing the adult with what he or she wants to hear 
So children may believe that they recall observing things that others have said they observed. So the testimony of children must be interpreted with great caution. But kids can also be influenced uh, by adults uh, in terms of even how the adult is questioning, uh, either forcefully or a little bit suggesting. So can eyewitness testimonies be improved? Uh, so I uh, made several suggestions to improve identification accuracy in lineups, uh, presenting only one suspect per lineup, uh, making sure that all people in the lineup are reasonably similar to each other, uh, cautioning witnesses that the suspect may not be in the lineup at all, uh, such kind of things. So they're trying to make suggestions how to improve the identification uh, of eyewitness uh, testimonies. So that's why I find out uh, uh, ways also psychology can be applied other than counseling also in a psychology and law where you end up you know trying to ensure that you don't distort or influence uh, the witness uh, memory so such kind of things are arranged so repressed memories are memories that are alleged to have pushed down into unconsciousness because of the distress they cause so do repressed memories actually exist so some therapists may inadvertently uh, plant ideas in their clients' heads. In this way, they may uh, indirectly uh, create false memories or events that never took place. Showing that implanted memories are false is often extremely hard to do. So that's why they say the repressed memory actually exists. So uh, uh, Rodija, uh, 1995 paradigm, 15 words strongly related to the word sleep. Why are people so weak? in distinguishing what they have heard from what they have not heard. So source monitoring error, which occurs when a person attributes a memory derived from one source to another. So that's why they call it source monitoring error, which occurs when a person attributes a memory derived from one source to another source. So spreading activation is every time an item is studied, you think of the item related to that item. You see, so the effect of the context on memory is emotional intensity, the mood, uh, state of consciousness also, uh, environmental context cues, what, uh, let's say maybe uh, ideas, uh, no cues. Now, so encoding specificity, uh, it refers to the fact that what is recalled depends largely on what is encoded. So that's why they call it encoding specificity. Whatever is uh, recorded depends largely on how you have put it in, in inside your head. So that is the exercise that I may give to people that we are going to bring into the uh, question forum or activity forum. What is the main difference between two of the proposed mechanisms? And so on, all these questions, uh, one is to go through the video and the lessons for them to attempt these uh, quiz questions. Uh, all questions, uh, and answers, uh, we may also come and ask in the uh, question forum or a discussion group. Have a wonderful day.